If your Bible naturally opens to the book of Mark, flip over a few more books to the book of Colossians. We are starting a brand new series today um, called This Is Us. Um, when they throw the This Is Us graphic up on occasion, you might recognize a few of your faces on the graphic uh, because the graphic represents that this is us. Um, so uh, our, my, my son Levi um, takes um, karate down at Webster's Studio, karate studio here in Decatur. Um, if you're looking for a karate studio that's uh, run very well by a great, great um, instructor, uh, Jamie Webster, then I would recommend uh, Webster's Karate Studio. Um, several of the kids from City Church have been a part of Webster's at different points, and Jamie's a great instructor and awesome with the kids. But one thing that they do every class is they go over what is known at Webster's as the core values. And they're up on the wall, and they say them every class um, in some way. I um, almost called on Keegan to stand up and tell us the core values. Can you do it? Do you want to do it? No, I won't put that pressure on him. He can say it with me while I say them. So every week at class, and, and Levi, it's like, like they don't send like a list home. Uh, they used to eventually learn these because they say them so much every class. And so every class, and sometimes it's a, affiliated with their having to do a push-up when they do it or something, uh, but every class it is, I know them, but I'd never get them in the right order. Levi has to correct me. Um, but the core values are respect, loyalty, wisdom, honor, courage, compassion, forgiveness, discipline, Patience, perseverance, self-control, focus, attitude, integrity, excellence, respect. That is Webster's karate core values. Aren't you impressed that I knew them? I had a cheat sheet. Core values. Core values are the fundamental beliefs of a person or an organization that are kind of the guiding principles that dictate the behavior and the actions of that organization. Core values basically are put in place to help you determine whether you are on the right path. Most often core values flow out of some bigger mission or purpose statement of an organization. This is the mission statement of a very famous, one of the most successful um, um, organizations, corporations in all of American history. I'm going to tell you just what their mission statement is and you see if you can tell me what the organization is. Here is the purpose statement. To make delicious, feel-good moments easy for everyone. To make delicious, feel-good moments easy for everyone. Any guesses? Not Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is, I think, something like honor God through chicken or something. <laughs> Serve up chicken Jesus as quickly as possible. Chicken Jesus? I got that backward. <laughs> Jesus chicken. Please don't leave here and say the pastor preached on chicken Jesus. <laughs> Not Hallmark. It sounds like it could be Hallmark. Um, are you ready for it? McDonald's. Um, and I know the delicious part threw you off, but that is the mission statement, the purpose statement of McDonald's, to make delicious, you can determine whether they succeed in that or not, um, delicious food, uh, feel-good moments, sometimes you don't always feel good <laughs> when you're going through the drive through and they don't get your order right, um, or whatever it may be, maybe it's the one, I'm not even going to say the one on 6th Avenue, even though that's what all of you are thinking. Um, the the feel-good moments, I said it, I said the one on 6th Avenue, the feel-good experiences that are easy for everyone, that is McDonald's purpose mission statement. Then they have core values that flow out of that. So you can decide whether McDonald's actually fulfills their um, mission statement or not. Our mission at City Church, our purpose statement is very simple. Um, City Church exists to, what we say, continue what Jesus began, what he began to do and teach. This flows out of um, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, which is volume 2 of the Gospel of Luke. 
And Luke writes the book of Acts, and in the opening statement, he says, in the first book, which was his gospel, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And so the book of Acts, and then everything after Acts, the rest of church history from the resurrection, ascension of Jesus on, has been about um, what Jesus, that we continue what Jesus began, that we continue what Jesus started, continue what Jesus began to do and teach. And then from that mission statement, that big purpose, City Church exists to continue what Jesus began, we have certain core values that flow out of that. And then those core values we talk about is what we are doing, is what we are teaching, continuing what Jesus began. And so every once in a while, we like to do a series here at City Church that reminds us what we are about. And so This Is Us is that series. It reminds us what we are about. And here's what I want to be very emphatic about. What we are about is grounded in what the Scriptures teach about the church, Big C Church. So every once in a while, you'll hear me talk about Big C Church. Big C Church means every person who's a follower of Jesus globally, from the time of Jesus till now, the Big C Church, everybody that knows Jesus, has a relationship with Jesus, is a, a part of this global, worldwide, eternal church. And then there are a bunch of small C churches. That's what City Church is. We're a small C local gathering of believers that are part of this universal Big C Church. And so what the Scriptures teach about the Big C Church translates down into individual gatherings that we call individual churches, little c churches. And the first core value of City Church, and the one that is the most important of all of our core values, is this. Uh, the core value number one of City Church is the church belongs to Jesus. The church belongs to Jesus. As a matter of fact, would you just say that uh, with me this morning? The church belongs to Jesus. Say it with me again. The church belongs to Jesus. So if I see you in the halls and I say, what's the number one core value of City Church? You're going to respond, what? And if you do, I'll be so impressed. The church belongs to Jesus. This, this truth flows out of the words of Jesus himself. Uh, we'll take it from Matthew. There's multiple places. We'll take the one from Matthew um, chapter 16, verse 18, Paul's, or Jesus is talking to Peter. Uh, Peter has just confessed uh, that Jesus is the Christ, and Jesus responds to Peter's statement by saying, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build what? My church, the church of Jesus. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it that Jesus will build his church, that it belongs to Jesus. So I have great news for us today as City Church. The church doesn't belong to us. That's good news. It's great news. The church belongs to Jesus. It is his church. And what Jesus has promised is that the church is not going away, that hell itself cannot prevail against his church. Here's why this truth is such good news. It's such good news because every church, every small C church across the world is filled with messed up, broken people. You are one of them. I am one of them. We see this played out on the headlines now, right? That the church is filled with messed up people who are going to get it wrong. They're going to make terrible mistakes. They're going to sin. They're going to mess things up. Churches are filled with messed up people who make mistakes, who have terrible attitudes at times, who respond the wrong way, who sin against each other, who sin against others. And what happens is we try to make the church about us. And that's where sin and pride and selfish, selfishness kick in. And we who profess to follow Jesus often mess up what we call the small C church, which gives a bad reputation to the big C church. And so there's really good news that ultimately the church doesn't belong to the messed up people who sit in its seats and profess its name. The church ultimately belongs to Jesus. And if we get our eyes on the people that are in the church, we're going to find a lot of flaws and mess ups and errors, and sins. That's why there's things like 
church splits and divides, and that's why there's <coughs> 10,000 denominations, and that's why there's First Baptist and Second Baptist and Third Baptist and Fourth Baptist, and that's why there's all these divisions that happen in the church, uh, because we get it wrong. We're not perfect, but the church belongs to Him, and we have to keep our eyes on the fact that it is His church and not our church. And that's why this movement of Jesus followers that we call the church that began 2,000 years ago continues today. Like how profound is that reality? That 2,000 years ago, Jesus began a movement that continues today. And it's even more profound when you think about the life of Jesus. I mean, think about it. Born in a stable, raised in a hick town. I'm not talking about Moulton. Sorry. I lived out there. I can do that, right? I'm talking about Nazareth. That was a hick town in its day. His mother was a poor, unwed teenager who claimed to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. His father, Joseph, was a blue-collar carpenter. Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life swinging a hammer. After 30 years, he began his public ministry, teaching, healing, feeding, befriending social misfits, and just three years of local ministry before he ticks off all the wrong crowd, which, by the way, happened to be the religious crowd. That's a statement in and of itself. But he ticks off the wrong crowd, the religious, and then he ends up dying this shameful death by crucifixion for claiming to be God, and then he's raised back to life, and the resurrection kickstarts this movement that we call Christianity. I mean, Jesus has an unimpressive resume. He never traveled globally. He never wrote a book. He never ran for office. He never went to college. He never married. He never won a gold medal, even though you have to say he would have been a shoe-in for the water walking event, right? But Jesus never won any prestigious awards. And 2,000 years later, we preach about him, sing to him, live lives that are shaped by him. Jesus is everywhere. He's the subject matter of debates. He's in music and books and TV and movies on clothes. He's in everyday conversations. I mean, he's even a slang term. Jesus is a big deal, and the church belongs to to him. Now, why is Jesus such a big deal, and why is it so important that we operate from the framework that the church belongs to Jesus? That's exactly what Paul answers in Colossians chapter 1. So let me set the context for you here. Understand that when the church movement began, we call it the early church, those first few pivotal years of the church, there was a lot of still trying to figure things out. A lot of conversations about who is Jesus. Uh, the context of that day was a context of a lot of different religions. There was a constant mixing of the religions. Paul, who was the earliest church planner and kind of theologian um, and, and the one who wrote half of the New Testament, he spends a lot of his letters battling this idea of who is Jesus. It's not very, this is kind of the same idea today that there's this kind of hodgepodge of religions, and you just choose whatever works for you. That is not, a, that is not an uncommon idea. It goes back 2,000 years to the time of Paul. And that's why Paul writes with such authority on these matters, that he is battling that idea of whatever works for you. And he's saying, no, it is Jesus and only Jesus. And so Paul writes this letter uh, to these Christians in the city of Colossae, and they are in danger of turning away uh, from the big C church, from the faith. And they are in danger due to heresies that have been false teaching that's been creeping into the church concerning who Jesus is. In particular, they were doubting whether Jesus was fully God and fully human. Now, let's be honest. Those are hard things to struggle with. We have the scriptures that lay it out for us. They didn't have that. They had the teaching of the apostles. And so they were wrestling with some things. How can he be fully God and how can he be fully human? And again, there's a common tendency today to make Jesus who we want him to be. 
that we want to make Jesus into kind of this good dude that spits out these kind of motivational truisms constantly. And, you know, you can go along with his motivational statements. And so there's kind of a common theme even in today's culture of this same idea. That the idea to embrace Jesus fully as human and fully as God means some things. And that's what Paul's addressing. And so Paul, after kind of a few pleasantries in the opening words, man, he cuts straight to the chase. He says, let me tell you who Jesus is. In verse 15, he makes one of the most profound statements about Jesus in all the New Testament. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Let's break down those two Pivotal phrases, <laughs> image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. This idea of the image of the invisible God has kind of two nuances. The first idea of this word image is the idea of representation. It represents something. Um, think in terms of a picture. Think in terms of a reflection in the mirror. When I look in a mirror, it is reflecting who I am. Good, bad, ugly, like it, don't like it. That's, a, that's a, an actual image of what's looking at it. I'm looking in the mirror, and the mirror's telling me, Devin, that's who you are. With all your blemishes, good, bad, and ugly, that's you. That's the image. That's your representation. Think about icons, right? They, an icon is something that represents the real thing. And so Paul is saying that Jesus represents God. He is the representative of God. This idea of image also has the idea of a, a display, a manifestation of something, that is the actual presence, that Jesus is not just a reflection, that he is actually God. That when I look in the mirror, there's one thing for the mirror to be a representation, but then there's me. I'm the actual manifestation of Devon. I'm Devon. And so this idea of image means that he represents God, but he is also a display, a manifestation of God. That Jesus brought God into the human sphere of understanding. He made the invisible God visible. That we could see Him, touch Him, know who He is. So if you want to know what God is like, look at and study the life of Jesus. And that tells you what God is like. Think about this transition. Old Testament, all this emphasis on you make no images of God, right? It's one of the big ten. Make no graven in images of God. Like, don't try to limit who God is by making an image of Him. Because the moment that you make an image of Him, you are limiting who God is. You're putting God into a level of understanding that you can wrap your mind around, and we can't do that to God. So think in terms, if there's another religion, think in terms of Buddha. When I say Buddha, there's an image that comes to your mind, right? There's an image of a kind of short, squatty dude that's like we call Buddha. You think of that when you think of Buddha. And so when I, when we, so the Old Testament is very clear, like do not make images of God because we don't want to limit your mind. And then the New Testament comes along, and the New Testament says Jesus is the image of God, that you can look at Jesus and know who God is, that you're not violating one of the big ten commandments because Jesus is the fulfillment of that commandment, that he is God, that he is the image of God. You've heard the story about the little boy is sitting down at the table and he's just rapidly uh, scribbling on a big piece of paper and he's got all kinds of markers and colors and he's just going to town and his mom comes up and looks over his shoulder and is like, what are you drawing? A little kid like without even missing a beat just keeps drawing and hammering out his little piece of art and he's like, I'm drawing God. Leave me alone. I'm drawing God. And the mom's like, well, no one knows who, what God looks like, and the little kid without missing a beat's like, they will. <laughs> we tend to do that, don't we? Like try to put God into some type of image we can understand. Well, Jesus is that. Whitney, calm down. <laughs> it was a good one, but not that good. I need to earmark this joke. It's like this one needs, if Whitney's in the audience, tell this one again. The image of God, knowing what God looks like. The New Testament says Jesus is the exact representation of God. Hebrews 1.3 says the exact imprint of his nature. John says in 1.18 we, that Jesus made God known. So the image of the invisible God. Then he uses his second phrase, the firstborn of all creation. Now, this is a controversial phrase. Because when you hear that term, firstborn, you think 
about your firstborn child, created, born into the world. There have been false teachers since the beginning of the church. They have taught the idea uh, that Jesus was created, that he was made. In the fourth century, it's a group called the Arians. Um, if you have someone knock on your door today um, with initials JW, uh, Jehovah's Witness, they believe the, believe the same thing, that Jesus was created. There's a created being. Now, I don't want you to think in terms of being created like we think of in terms of the idea of firstborn. Instead, what this word means, it is a priority of rank. It is a position. When he says firstborn, that means he has the highest authority. He has the highest privilege, that he's the rightful heir, that he has the full authority of the Father, that there is no one or no thing in all of creation that is over him or more superior to him. And that's what Paul lays out beginning in verse 16. So verse 16, he follows up this phrase, the firstborn of all creation, with this explanation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, <clears throat> all things were created through him and for him. That Jesus is, so he explains this idea of firstborn with that phrase that He is the Creator of all things. It was created by Him, created in Him is the idea, uh, that Jesus, that as the Son of God, was involved in the creative process, that creation originated with the Son of God, that He brought all things into existence, that Paul says it was created through Him. That means by His ability, by His power, that He is the Creator of all things. And then Paul says it was created for Him, that everything in all of creation exists for the glory of Jesus, that all creation is about Him. So again, if we could kind of illustrate this, think of a sculptor, a sculptor who takes a piece of stone or takes a piece of wood or whatever material they are using, and in that sculptor's mind, there's an image Think of an artist painting on a canvas. Uh, think of whatever type of art that involves this creative idea of taking something that did not exist that now exists. So a sculpt sculptor, a painter, an artist, they take materials and they may create, they form. But the only reality of what that thing, that object is going to be is where? It's in the mind of the sculptor. It's in the hand of the creator. It's in the mind of the artist. And what ends up on that canvas or what ends up in that sculpting happens in the mind of the sculptor. And they shape and they form what their mind sees. The art is the product of the artist. And the art speaks to the creation made by the artist, right? The art screams. I was made by this famous artist. I was created by this artist. The art represents the mind of the artist. And what this phrase means is that when we look at all of creation, that it speaks to the artist, that it speaks to the sculptor. And all of creation says we all belong to him, that he is the creator, that it started in his mind with his work, that he created all things and all things are for His glory. So when we look through the art that we live in, that we call the world, the earth that we exist in, all of creation points and sings toward an artist, a creator that says we belong to Him. He is the artist. All glory belongs to Him. So the word that Paul's using here is a, a word that makes Jesus preeminent, that He is the creator of all things, that all creation points to Him the sculptor, to him. But Paul takes it a whole different level in 17. Again, explaining this idea of image, explaining this idea of the firstborn of creation. 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul says he is before all things. This speaks to his preexistence, that he existed before all things, that he is the eternal God, that he has lived from eternity past. Paul says he is the sustainer of all things. He holds it together. All of us have a family member who's that, right? The person in the family that holds it together. The person they look to. The steady. When things seem chaotic, this person's holding it together. 
And I like the image of like Jesus is that for the church. As chaotic as it gets in all of creation, and particularly in the church, that Jesus is the one that holds it together. That it is all about him, that he is sustaining and holding it together. So here's Paul's argument. Jesus is preeminent over everything. He created it. He maintains it. It is all for his glory. Jesus is a big deal. He is the biggest deal in all eternity, in all creation. Jesus is a big deal. And then notice how he breaks this down in the next verse. This is where it gets so relevant for the small sea gathering all around the world, churches all around the world. We can't forget this. Paul takes it from this global, eternal idea. And then in 18, he says, and he, this preeminent one, this creator, all of creation is for him and by him and for his glory. This creator, this Jesus, this image of the invisible, this firstborn of all creation, this superior one, this preeminent one, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, every, that in everything he might be preeminent. Paul says, this Jesus, this one I'm describing, he is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. The preeminent one is over us. The church belongs to him. Jesus is the head of this thing that we call the church. It's not you. It's not me. It's not elders. It's not deacons. Jesus is the head of the church. That's why on occasion you'll hear me use this phrase, that Jesus is the senior pastor of every church, that he is the one who is the true pastor. You see, without the head, the body just withers and dies. With all the technological advances we've made, you know, one that we haven't made and will not make, you can't live without a head. No time in the future are you going to see bodies walking around without heads. You can't live without a head. The body withers and dies without a head. And Paul says Jesus is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. Without him, there is no existence. So what gives him this authority besides the fact he is the creator? Paul throws this tidbit in that we emphasized last week. He's the firstborn from the dead. The reason he's the head is because he conquered death. No one has been able to pull that one off except for Jesus. The church exists because Jesus is alive. That's why Easter is a big deal, and that's why every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Not just one day on a calendar that we call Easter. Every single Sunday is Resurrection Sunday because every single Sunday we gather for one reason, because Jesus died and came back to life. He's alive, so we show up and worship Him because no one else has pulled that off. He is the preeminent one, and he is the one who is head of the church. And so Paul says Jesus is preeminent. He is unsurpassed. He's the top of the food chain. And the reason why is because he is alive. 19, he kind of circles back on us. Let me reemphasize it. If you didn't hear it the first time, Paul says, and through him to reconcile or 19, we back up to 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So again, everything that <clears throat> makes God God is a part of who Jesus is. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So 19 again, Jesus is preeminent because of who he is. He's fully God. 20. Jesus is preeminent because of what he did, what he is doing. We call this the gospel, the good news, that God the Son became flesh, Paul says, to reconcile to himself all things. And the reason that he has to reconcile to himself all things is because all things are in need of reconciliation. Everything is impacted. Everything is affected by sin. Every person, the world itself, is all impacted by sin. That we are born as sinners with a sinful nature. That we are estranged from God. And Paul says, by the blood of his cross, he makes peace, he makes reconciliation possible. 
that sin destroyed and is destroying. Like, can't we all, can't we all like speak to this? That sin has destroyed things in our lives? Or maybe sin is destroying things in your life? Like, is there anything going on in your life right now that's just broken and marred and tainted by sin? Like, anything in your life? Like, do you have relationships right now that are just breaking down and it's because of sin? Anything like going on in your heart or um, even in our, our finances or our, our work life or school life, whatever it may be, we just see the impact of sin over and over, of making sinful choices and how that plays itself out in our lives and how it robs our peace and steals our joy and breaks down our marriages and robs us of our, uh, the healthy relationships with our kids and our coworkers and our friends. Like sin has one agenda. It breaks and destroys and harms and hurts and damages and kills. That's the narrative of sin. Ash and I talk about this all the time. Like people will come to us, even in our own experience, our own lives, and then dealing with a lot of different people, and we just scratch our heads and say the narrative never changes. It never goes away. He's always out to destroy your marriage. Every single time, he's out to destroy it and to ruin it. He's out to destroy your life. Like people come and sit across from us, and it's just the same narrative again. Like sin has one goal. It is to take you down, to destroy you, to harm you, to hurt, to destroy, to maim, to break down. It has one narrative, and we are all impacted by it day in and day out, this narrative of sin. And then Paul stops and he says, enter Jesus. Enter Jesus, that his story rewrites the narrative, that he reconciles the broken by being broken, that he takes sin's curse upon himself and reconciles us with the Father, that everything that sin breaks and maims and destroys, that Jesus takes that curse, he takes that consequence upon himself on the cross, and he makes reconciliation restoration, redemption possible through the story of the cross. Like, look how Paul describes us. We didn't read this in the beginning, but look in 21 and 22 how Paul describes us. Paul says, and you who once were, okay, so like this is what you were, right, before making peace by the blood of the cross, and you who once were alienated, right, that means estranged from God, You were hostile in your mind, doing evil deeds. So that means sin impacts us mentally. It impacts our actions. Like everything about us is impacted. We are alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. And here's the purpose. In order to present you, who's the you here? This is Jesus followers. This is small C churches. This is big C global church in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. Like the description here is that we were alienated and hostile. This is enmity language, that we were enemies of God in our mind and our actions, that He has bridged the gap. He has reconciled us through His death for a purpose. What's the purpose? In order to present us holy, blameless, above reproach. Those are not descriptive words that I use about myself. Holy, blameless, above reproach? Like it is only through the peace of the cross that we qualify that He makes us these things before Him. And again, remember, He is the preeminent one. Now, I don't even have time to chase these verses. But I want to tell you, like if you you get the gospel truth, if you capture the gospel truth in these two verses... It will change your life. It will change how you live. It will change your idea of what it means to be acceptable before God. It will change your idea of what Christ has done on your behalf. It will change your idea of where this thing is headed. Like if we get this gospel truth, that He has done everything necessary to present us holy, blameless, and above reproach before Him, it will revolutionize the way that we live life. This is powerful language here. That reminds us of one thing. He is the head of the church. Like, 
you read these things and, and you, you have to think, like, does anybody else qualified? Like, does anybody, want, anybody else want to step up and take charge? Like, when you read Creator, the Reconciler, the one who makes all this possible, is there anybody else ready to sign up and let, let me be in charge of the church? Like, we don't qualify, right? That's why the church belongs to Jesus. Anybody else want to take charge? Anybody else want to take over this thing we call the church? No, because it is His church, because He reconciles, He perseveres, He will one day present it. He will present it before the Father, holy, blameless, above reproach. And so as a church, as a small c local gathering that we call City Church, we continue what he began out of the posture, the church belongs to Jesus. We're his. We're his. And that is good news for us because he and he alone is the preeminent one. Like, I, I don't want that weight as a pastor. I don't want that weight as a leader of City Church. I don't want that for one second for you think, to think this is about Devin, about Ashley, about the elders, about any of our leaders. I don't want for one second to you, for you to think that this whole thing is about us in any way. It's not. It is about him, and it will always be about him. You know why? I don't qualify. I can't wear the weight. Like, I'm going to fulfill the role that God's called me to do here at City Church, but don't think for a second that this church is about us or our church or my church or your church. This is his church, and we're going to rest in him, point to him, elevate him, praise him, preach about him, sing to him. It's his church, not our church. It belongs to him. And we're going to say it over and over and over and over. But we are His, and that is good news, because He is the preeminent one. And by the way, it is His church because He purchased it with His own blood. That's why these doors are painted red, because He purchased it with His own blood. And that's why we sit in these seats every week and remind ourselves week in and week out, we belong to Jesus. City Church The church belongs to Jesus. So every single week, I can promise you, when you sit in these seats, we're going to make it about Him. Every single week, it's going to be about Him. Are we always going to get it right? No. We're going to drop the ball sometimes? Yes. Are we going to make it about us every once in a while when we get things out of whack? Yes. All those things are going to happen because we're broken people. But week in, week out, day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, when you're sitting in these seats, when you're living it out in the community, we want you to know it's His church. It belongs to Him. We're going to make it about Him. We're going to sing to Him, preach about Him, teach our kids about Him, point people to Him, invite people to follow Him. It's going to be about Jesus and not about us because the church belongs to Jesus. And that's why this core value is so important. We can do away with all the others if we have to, but we're not going to lose this one because it's his church and the church belongs to him. So let me just mention one other way that this applies to us in in everyday life at City Church and then we're going to be done. So one way that we uh, make the church about Jesus and invite you to be a part of this small C gathering that we call City Church as a part of this big C global gathering of followers all over the world is one thing that we practice here at City Church that you may or may not be familiar with according to where you're at on your spiritual journey is this idea of baptism. What is baptism? Um, Baptism is identifying with two ideas of the church. It is identifying with Jesus I belong to Jesus. Baptism is saying, I belong to Jesus. I follow Jesus. He is my Savior, my King. I follow Him. I belong to Jesus. That's Big C Church. Every person who professes Jesus and follows Jesus globally, no matter what their label, no matter where they're at in their spiritual walk, if they are a follower of Jesus, they're part of the Big C Church. And baptism says, I belong to Jesus, who is the head of the church. He is the preeminent one. My allegiance is to Him. And then we baptize in little local, local expressions of the Big C Church. In these small C churches, we baptize in local churches because baptism is also saying, I belong to a group of people who are also followers of Jesus. 
I identify with Jesus and I identify with a local expression, a local gathering of believers who are also people on this journey of following Jesus. That's why we baptize here. That's why we celebrate it. And we say, like, you're identifying with Jesus and this broken group of people that we call City Church. My favorite illustration about baptism, it has its shortcomings, but I like it because it's a visual, um, is the idea of the wedding ring. I can take this ring off and lay it on this podium, and guess what? I'm still a married person. That ring does not make me married. It is a symbol, an identification, identifying mark that I'm a married person. But if I go to my sweet wife and say, babe, I love you, but I do not want a single person to know it. I'm not going to wear that ring because then people will know I'm married. She'll be like, we need to have a conversation. It's not really working for me on the idea of why you should wear the wedding ring. You know why I wear this ring? Because I want every single person I encounter to know, one, I'm a married person, and two, that I'm married to a sweet lady named Ashley Hudson, who is my bride, um, who is my right hand and my best friend in life, and I want people to know I'm married to her. And I wear this so everybody knows Devin is married, and if they know us, he's married to Ashley. He identifies with her, that he belongs to her, and she belongs to him, that they're a married couple. And baptism is kind of that wedding ring of the Christian faith that says, I belong to Jesus. It's not what makes me a married person. It's not what makes me a follower of Jesus. But it sure goes hand in hand with it. It sure identifies me as a person who belongs to Jesus and belongs to a group of people that we call City Church. And so that's why baptism, especially for adults when they come to faith in Christ, is one of those first steps to say, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Him. And so over and over in the New Testament, what we do not find are people who are followers of Jesus who are not baptized. And what we also do not find are people who are baptized who are not followers of Jesus yet. And so that's why we practice what we call believer's baptism. That when a person makes a conscious commitment to follow Christ with their life, and that their baptism is that mark, that symbol that says, I belong to Jesus. Now, if you know me, um, I, I'm, I'm one of these that's like, um, I don't push like little kids to get baptized and all those things. Like I want it to be a big deal that you know and embrace the idea of following Christ. So sometimes we're okay with, you know, kids that are younger, like pushing them off and saying, hey, you'll understand, we'll talk about it, let's have those conversations. But if you're a person who is older and has followed Jesus, and there's no magical age for this, right? But if you're a person who's consciously followed Christ and belonged to him, I say, yeah, identify with Christ through those waters. Identify with this local church because here's why it's important in light of Colossians 1. Because Colossians 1 says you are dead in your sins, alienated from God and hostile toward God. And Jesus has done all things to reconcile you by the blood of the cross, to make peace through the blood of the cross, that you're a blood-purchased people. And so what baptism says is I was alienated and hostile outside of God, but I have died to myself in Christ. That's what going under the water is. I am dying to myself in Christ, and I'm being raised to walk in newness of life as a follower of Jesus, that the old Devon has died and is done away with, and I am raised to walk as a new follower of Christ. That's the beauty of baptism that Paul emphasizes over and over, that you as a follower of Jesus were dead in your sins, and then through what Christ has done, through his death, through his resurrection, you have been raised by him to walk in newness of life. You are identifying with Jesus, and you're identifying with this local gathering that we call City Church. And so we invite you, like if you're a part of the family, and that's your next step um, in following Christ to get baptized, like, let's do it. Like, we got this thing up here now, right? We're not like dragging a feeding trough out from out from under and getting the cobwebs out of it and trying to spray that sucker down so you don't get infected with something. Like, we've got, so we just open these doors and dunk you uh, to, to say this person belongs to Jesus. And you know, we want these waters to be on the move, on the regular, right? Men, women, boys, girls coming to faith in Christ and professing, I belong to Jesus and I belong to this expression that we call City Church. So, City Church. I say all that. I felt like I said it really fast and at a high pace. I say all that to say this church exists to continue what Jesus began. First and foremost, what that means for us is we live it out in the everyday. 
is we want to remind ourselves week in and week out of one thing, our number one top core value. We're passing each other in the hall now. Our number one core value, which is what? Like half of you passed the test. Our number one core value is what? So let's make it about him.